I'm Chelsea Warner, the president of the Supreme Court Historical Society. Excuse my hoarseness, we're back into pollen season here in Atlanta. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the third uh, segment of the Society's newest virtual lecture series. This one uh, concentrates on civics and American democracy. A critical element of the society is to educate the public about the work, the role, and the independence of the Supreme Court of the United States, as well as that of the federal judiciary as a whole. Today's speaker is retired Judge Thomas B. Griffith, now special counsel at the well-known firm of Hunton Andrews Kurth. Judge Griffith served on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia from 2005 through 2020. The judge began his legal career in private practice before serving for four years as Senate Legal Counsel, a position that is the nonpartisan chief legal officer from the United States Senate. He occupied that role from 1995 to 1999. After a brief return to private practice, Judge Griffith served for five years as general counsel of Brigham Young University, the largest religious university in the country. As a member of the DC Circuit, Judge Griffith was the author of approximately 200 opinions. He was appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States to serve on the Judicial Conferences Committee on the Judicial Branch, which involves the judiciary's relationship to both the executive branch and the Congress. He served also on the Code of Conduct Committee, which sets the ethical standards that govern the federal judiciary. Judge Griffith is a lecturer on law currently at Harvard Law School. He held the same faculty position at the law schools of Stanford and Brigham Young. He has long been active in projects devoted to the rule of law in Eastern Europe, Eurasia, and domestically. Most recently, President Biden appointed Judge Griffith to serve on the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court, which finished its work in December of 2021. Judge Griffith will be discussing the importance of an independent federal judiciary in a conversation with the society's own executive director, Jim Dove. Judge Griffith and Jim, I'm turning the floor over to you now. We appreciate your being available this afternoon and spending the time and energy to provide us with a stimulating afternoon. It's all yours, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much, Chilton, uh, for your kind introduction of Judge Griffith. And uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Tom, as I know him, with Judge Griffith. I, I will refer to him as Judge throughout the conversation uh, with due respect. We've known each other for a number of years. And uh, I want to first thank Tom for his uh, many years of public service as a counsel to the Senate, as Chilton has described. And judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, which uh, many describe as the second most powerful court in the country. Uh, judge Griffith's opinions are of great import and influence uh, while serving on that, uh, uh, that court. Judge Griffith brings today to us a unique perspective to our topic from the highest levels of two branches of our government on the issue of importance of judicial independence. 
And I'd like to begin our uh, discussion and conversation today, uh, Judge Griffith, with uh, your time as counsel to the Senate, and particularly when our time overlapped when I was counselor to Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, in those same years. We worked together on the impeachment uh, trial in 1999. And during that trial, uh, the Senate established the rules and procedures for the trial. I recall meeting with you and, and uh, the Senate leadership at the time, <clears throat> Senators uh, Lott and Daschle on how the trial was going to be run. And of course, Chief Justice Rehnquist who had authored the Supreme Court opinion in Nixon versus United States prior to this, uh, long prior to uh, the, this impeachment trial. And it wasn't President Nixon, by the way, it was Judge Nixon from Mississippi who had challenged some impeachment procedures when he was uh, under trial uh, for a, in an impeachment proceeding in the Senate. But Chief Justice Rehnquist had authored the opinion uh, that it was the Senate's choice as to how to structure the trial. Uh, my question is, and as a long intro, it's a big wind up for the pitch, but here, uh, here it is. Do you see any parallels between that authority uh, in the Senate and its conduct of the impeachment trial and the need for judicial independence in the judicial branch of government? I, I do, but before I answer that, let me tell you how, uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, I, I would do something unpleasant for Jim Duff, uh, and, th and this is not unpleasant. This is this is an honor. Um, I, 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 there's no one I've met in my career who for whom I have higher regard, both for his brilliance and his decency, uh, than Jim Duff. So Jim, it's 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 a it's an honor to to, to be here with you. Um, th that's a great question, um, uh, and I, I I think the answer is there there are lessons to be learned. There there are parallels. You know, uh, Judge Sutton has just uh, written yet another masterpiece, right? He, how does he do this? He just uh, keeps publishing these uh, important books that we all ought to read and study. And the most recent one, uh, I'm going to talk about the title more than anything else. It's Who Decides? Now, now he, he takes it uh, at the angle of uh, the federalism issue, right? Who, you know, who, who, who decides? Um, I want to I want to uh, focus on the separation of powers issues, because as I understand it, this is the most important thing that the Constitution did, is it tells us who decides, <laughs> who, who, who has the lane to make laws, who's in the lane to enforce laws, who's in the lane to resolve disputes according to the laws. Um, and those are those are those are the three branches, um, and and one of the things that was uh, illuminating to me when we worked together on putting together the uh, trial, and and we ought to let the audience know we we weren't prosecuting the the, the president or defending. We were we were advising in my case the Senate, in your case the the Chief Justice, of what their roles were, right? What their roles were in this unusual uh, uh, proceeding. Um, and uh, who decides answered a lot of those questions, right? As it, <clears throat> as it turns out, it's uh, surprising to some that when the chief justice comes over and becomes the presiding officer of the Senate, uh, he's there more as an officer of the Senate than he is as the chief justice. It's a very, very strange, very strange situation, um, at, which means um, that in one sense, He's subordinate to the Senate, Senate leadership, right? I mean, any any decision the Chief Justice was, was to render, and he didn't have to render many, but could be overruled uh, by the Senate, right? It was a very strange uh, situation. So that was illuminating to me in that process to see the Senate had its power and its authority, uh, its domain. The Supreme Court had its, and and and. To, to carefully delineate the two was an important part of the job that both you and I had with our uh, re respective interests. If you don't, if you don't mind, I, I recall a, a story. You 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 may remember this. Al although it's true that Chief Justice Rehnquist had had uh, uh, been involved in the Nixon case and, and wrote a book on impeachment, right? The, the grand inquest. Uh, I, I remember 
it, it might have been one of our first meetings, uh, Jim. We were in the office of the Senate uh, Sergeant at Arms around one of these one of these big, beautiful, ornate rooms and around a big mm. table. And um, you, you set forth the Chief Justice's thoughts about how the trial ought to, how to, how to unfold. And it was a very thoughtful approach. And, and it, was, uh, it was judicial. It, uh, it uh, you know, it, it, it talked about uh, all sorts of steps that one would think you would do in a trial. Um, and uh, it was my, my task to point out that well that's you know sort of thank you for the recommendation mr chief justice i'll take it to <laughs> senator lott and senator dashell and see what they think <laughs> and, and uh, uh so that was a little bit uh, awkward we then later had a meeting at the supreme court where the sort of with, with the chief justice showed up and the leadership showed up it was a very very impressive uh meeting. it was it was in the attorney's uh lounge right yes, yes. That, that we had set up um so but but the story i want to tell is um you may recall Chief Justice Rehnquist very much wanted uh, to see the Senate chamber. Uh, and he was anxious about his back, you know, yes. he covered his back and he wanted to make certain that, uh, that we had a chair that was suitable for him and that there was enough space up on the dais to be able to, to, to walk around because he needed to stretch occasionally. And so we, we, it was in December, the Senate was, was not in session and we arranged a, a meeting on the floor of the Senate so he could get familiar with the surroundings. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the part I remember is he, we had him seated at, at the dais, uh, chair height, comfortable. Um, and then he noticed there was a microphone uh, in, in, in front of him. And, and he, he looked around and he said, so how, how do I turn on the microphone? <laughs> and, and the Senate uh, Sergeant of Arms, uh, Jim Ziegler, uh, was waiting for this. And he stepped forward and he said, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, if you'll look to the gallery in your right, you'll see our technician. And, and I don't know what the technician's name is. I'll call him Bill. You'll see our technician, Bill. Bill, would you wave for the Chief Justice? And sure enough, in the gallery, there was a technician who, who waved. And he said, Bill has the switch for your microphone. And he answers to Senator Lott. <laughs> it, was, it was just this moment where you sort of thought, okay, this is, this is an unusual uh, setting. This is going to have its run. But anyway, that, that's a long-winded um, uh, answer. Uh, but I think it, it demonstrates the point that, that each of these institutions has a role to play. And sometimes that role changes uh, in the circumstances. Long mm -hmm. way of saying, um, I'm very wary of Congress stepping outside its lane. It has a lane with respect mm -hmm. to the courts. They are the Judiciary Act created the court I was on and, um, and the, the, the inferior courts. It has its lane, uh, but I get anxious about uh, proposals to step out, what I would say to step outside its lane and to infringe on the, uh, the independence of the, of, of the judiciary. So, uh, uh, so I'm pretty conservative uh, when, it, when it comes, and I, and I think it's vital. I think, I think it's vital, partic particularly at this moment where we see this hyper uh, partisan uh, atmosphere. I think it's really vital that to the extent the constitution allows and, and demands that the judiciary maintain its independence, uh, main maintain its independence against political pressure and against right. party pressure. So. That, those are, uh, you triggered many memories uh, from those days, and uh, it was a joy to work with you on that, Tom, and, and uh, I, I think uh, we worked very hard, I know you did, throughout your career as being nonpartisan in, in the role that you played as counsel to the Senate, and uh, uh, I, of course, tried to do the same in, in, in the Chief Justice's chambers. But I do remember that the, uh, the, the first visit, and I hope it didn't come across as the chief um, sort of, he wasn't demanding in any way that the trial be, be run in a certain way. He was offering, uh, you know, an option. But as I mentioned, you know, he did uh, author the opinion in Nixon versus United States, which challenged the procedures that the Senate set forth for running the impeachment trial. Uh, they actually had a committee, I think, at that time, uh, review his case rather than the full Senate. And Chief Justice, then Justice Rehnquist, I think, authored the opinion, and, and he, Judge Nixon took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that uh, 
he doesn't have a legitimate challenge because of the very things you just articulated, the, the stay in your lane, the, this is uh, the Senate's trial, the Senate can run it as it saw, saw fit. And uh, so he authored that opinion and it came as no surprise to Chief Justice Rehnquist that the Senate and, and you and the leadership came up with your own procedure for that trial. He was perfectly fine yeah. with that. And, uh, but. Well, yeah, I, no, no, I, no, I didn't mean to suggest that there was uh, any sense that he was uh, being overbearing. No, he got the ball yeah. started. No, he yeah. got the ball started. He, he laid it out and, and, and it, 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 it got things moving along. I, I remember at one point, I, I don't want to, spend all our time reminiscing about you know, there, was a, there was a there was a time when when it was pretty unique that you were involved in an impeachment trial of the president but the, yeah, right. the coin that coin has been devalued of late um, uh, but, but I, re I remember at, at one point um early on in the proceeding one of the house managers at a break came to me and said this isn't like any trial i've ever seen and and the point was you're right uh, it's different we're, yes. we're not in the, we're not in the judicial system right now we're in the senate and the senate no. gets to make the rule of its own proceedings there there have to be some limits on that and and chief justice Rehnquist acknowledged that and justice Souter in a concurrence acknowledged that now, you can't have a coin flip and you know but no. but you know uh the senate the senate gets to decide um its rules and and that's again it's an important reminder that these institutions play different roles and, yes. and, 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 and I'm all for reinforcing uh, the roles of the institutions. Well, you've had a phenomenal career uh, and, and, uh, and at, as I say, the highest levels of, of two branches of government. And um, let's talk about your, your time as a judge. And uh, after uh, leaving as counsel to the Senate, I know you uh, went into the private sector for a bit, and uh, but uh, to my uh, joy, you were uh, you did get appointed to the bench. And uh, why why did you want to become a judge? Or and tell us a little bit about what sure. led you to that path. Yeah. So uh, it it actually so it, it was actually the first week I was back at uh, Wiley Ryan and Fielding. I was literally after I had been uh, Senate Legal Counsel. I was literally unpacking my boxes in my in my office when I got a phone call from a friend who pointed out that uh, my experience as Senate legal counsel was an unusual one in that I was a, a conservative Republican, um, but had served in this nonpartisan position uh, and worked with many Democratic senators and many Republican senators and had... Uh, fortunately won their confidence and, and in some cases their friendship and pointed out that's an, you know, that's an unusual um, set of factors. Would you, would you ever think about uh, being an appeals court judge? And uh, it, it, honestly, I, that is not something that I had uh, ever considered before. I just assumed I was going to go back into private practice and was happy there. Uh, but uh, based on that, friend's recommendation, I, I, I called up a couple of friends who were appeals court judges and just talked to them about it. And the more I, I, I did not clerk uh, after law school, I had many friends who did. So I had some sense of what uh, a Chambers was like, but uh, uh, I, I needed to learn more about it. And as I, the more I learned about it, the more interested I, I got and uh, said, okay, I'm, I'm willing to to throw my hat uh, in the ring. And, and the original plan uh, was that I was going to be a Clinton nominee to the Fourth Circuit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was a member of the North Carolina Bar. And so the thought, it, it, it has a Rube Goldberg-like quality to it, as you'll see, and it didn't <laughs> happen. But, but the thought was that um, I would be an acceptable uh, 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 compromise um, uh, that that President Clinton would appoint in order to get someone else who he really liked. <laughs> and so, so that was the, and it, it didn't work. It didn't work. But as it turns out, once your name is thrown in that hat, it it stays there a, a, a while. And so, uh, I, I took the job at Brigham Young and was out there uh, in 2000. 
uh, when uh, President, uh, President Bush won. And, uh, and so th then the phone calls came again saying, would you, are, are you interested in this? And I spoke with my new employer and they gave me the green light to express interest. And um, one thing led to another and, and uh, I got appointed. Now, uh, it, it's been, it's been, uh, it was uh, amusing is not the right word. I don't know. It's been interesting to me to, to watch Judge uh, Jackson's confirmation hearings. And I haven't been able to watch uh, all of them, but I, but I was there the first day. And uh, I, I think several times the case of Miguel Estrada was, uh, was, was mentioned. And um, uh, as we know, uh, Miguel was uh, nominated by uh, President Bush for the DC circuit. And that was the target of a democratic filibuster. And it was when Miguel withdrew uh, his name uh, that President Bush had to decide uh, who should I nominate now? And I, it, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of that. So if, if one of your questions later today is what do I think of the filibuster for judicial nominees? I'm all for it. No, <laughs> I'm the well, beneficiary of that. I, I, what I tell my law clerks is I'm what you get when you really want Miguel Estrada, <laughs> but you got a filibuster. So, uh, so I'm either an argument for or against the, um, uh, the filibuster in that way. But. Well, you're being modest on both fronts, and you you alluded to uh, your attendance on Monday and Judge Jackson's confirmation hearing, and and uh, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Because, but you were more than at an attendee. You were, I, I, and I, I. This is a another uh, accolade. I think uh, you were asked by Judge Jackson to introduce her to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And well, let's let's go ahead and talk about that now, and I'll come back to uh, your your background for being a judge. But since we we raised it, um, let's talk uh, about that, and then we'll we'll talk about the appointment process generally. But I, I think it was uh, a very uh, wise choice by Judge Jackson to ask you to do that. Um, can you fill us in a little bit? about that experience and um, sure. and, I, and, and and your remarks, because it really goes to the heart, or one of the things I would hope to, uh, to bring out today uh, is a return to civility in our discourse. Yeah, no, I was, uh, so I've known uh, uh, Judge Jackson since she uh, went on the district court in, in DC. You know, we're all in the same building. So you you run into each other. So I'd run into her in the building. Um, we did a couple of moot courts uh, uh, together. So I got to know her a little bit better on on, on, on those occasions. And then um, I, there were several occasions when I was on a panel that would review an appeal of a case from her, uh, from her court. So, um, and, and in all those settings, I was just deeply impressed um, by uh, the, the care and attention to detail uh, with which she approached cases, her judicial temperament, her even-handed manner, uh, her collegiality. She's just uh, a really delightful person uh, to, to be around and respectful of, of, of others. And so when she was nominated, and I also, uh, I, I, over, I reversed her twice. <laughs> <laughs> now, in one of those cases, uh, the end bank DC circuit reversed me. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but, you know, reasonable people can come to different conclusions about what the law requires. And I don't think it speaks to one's competency or character or, 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 or qualification. Uh, but, but, but anyway, so I, 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 I got to know her pretty well. And when she was nominated for the DC circuit, um, uh, she reached out to me and said, would you be willing to write a letter of support on my hat? And I said, we have, and I said, I'd love to. And I, so I did, and that went well. And so that when she was nominated for the Supreme Court, she did me the honor of saying, would, you know, would you write a letter? And I said, yes. And then that went well. And so then she said, how about introducing me at the, uh, at the, at the committee hearing? And I, I told her I was, uh, was, was honored to do so. And, uh, um, something I think, it, a little footnote that might be uh, interesting, uh, I was allowed to say what I wanted to say. I, um, I, uh, the White House sent me a draft. I completely rewrote it. It was fine. It was fine, but it was anodyne. I just didn't think it captured the, 
the significance of the moment or, uh, or the importance of uh, the fact that a, a, a former judge who had been appointed by a conservative Republican president was an enthusiastic supporter of a judge who was appointed by a progressive Democrat. I wanted to, I wanted to, 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 to highlight that. And, and then they let me say what I wanted to say, which I give them, I give them high marks, uh, high marks for that. And so, um, so yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a delightful experience, but there's no pressure on me, right? No one was going to ask me questions. So it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was an honor. Uh, it, it was, you know, for folks like us, it was fun. It was great, great setting. It was, I think Senator Booker, uh, his comments uh, captured best my feelings. And I think the feelings of a lot of people there, Th there was a joyfulness about, um, about this uh, occasion because of, uh, for many reasons. Uh, for those of us who know uh, Judge Jackson, there's a personal pride in a, a friend and a colleague whose excellence is recognized. Uh, obviously the fact that this is the first uh, a black woman uh, to be nominated to the Supreme Court is a, is a, is a, a, a milestone for which I think we all take um, some, some, some pride. Um, so it was just, uh, it was, it was a, it was a wonderful uh, experience. I, I, I tried, um, you know, I'm a bit of a dinosaur on this one. I, I you know, I, uh, I remember, but we all remember, Justice Scalia was confirmed by a vote of 98 to nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, no one had any illusions about who Antonin Scalia was or what he thought about the law. I mean, right. there's no illusions about it. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, shortly thereafter, 96 to three, no one had any illusions about her view of the Constitution and the laws. And yet, and yet um, there was overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, not, you know, generation later, uh, a law clerk of Justice Scalia, uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who says she uh, is going to follow his example in many ways, um, doesn't get a single vote across the aisle. Now, some, obviously something has changed. And so then the question I think we need to ask is, is that a change for the better or a change for the worse? And I, for one, think it's a change for the worse. I think, it's, I think it signals uh, a threat, uh, a real threat uh, to the independence uh, of the judiciary, as well as it mirrors uh, uh, the problem of hyper-partisanship that, that has uh, insinuated itself into like every nook and cranny of American life. That's, 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 that's not a good thing. Uh, so I think this is an occasion where, as I, as I said in my remarks, I'd like to return to regular order. Mm. Uh, let's go mm. to regular order. And because uh, one of the fears I have about these hyper-partisan votes for uh, for Supreme Court nominees, is that it reinforces this no. perception among many in the public that judges are just partisans in robes, right? Um, and uh, and and they're not. <laughs> they're they're not. Um, uh, in the 15 years I was on the D.C. Circuit, never once, not once, did I see any of my colleagues cast a vote that I thought was motivated in any way by some partisan preference. They were, they were motivated by different ways of reading a statute, different views of deference to agencies, all those sorts of things. Yes, but partisan affiliation? No, I, you know, I, I applauded the Chief Justice when he rebuked President Trump for saying, we don't have Obama judges and Clinton judges. We, now, most people don't believe that, but, I'm, but I, you know, I'm, in the 15 years I was on the DC circuit, Never once did I see that partisanship uh, involved. Now, I haven't been on the Supreme Court, uh, but Justice Breyer tells us uh, it isn't that way there. And as I teach my, I, I teach, a, as you mentioned, I teach a class at, uh, uh, at, at Harvard Law School about the role of a judge. And, and just this last semester, we, we talked about Justice Breyer's views that judges are not partisans in robes. And I said, okay, you, you, what do you think of that? There are only a couple of explanations you can come up with. One, he's lying. Are you going to say Stephen Breyer's lying? I'm not going to. I don't think he's capable of that. Um, 
he's a fool. You think Stephen Breyer's fool? Ah, no, 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 I don't think so. How about this possibility? He's right. No, he's right that, um, that there are plenty of reasons to explain five, four votes, but you can't explain them along the lines of a justice is trying to advance a partisan agenda. And, and discussions that are premised on that are dangerous. Uh, I think they're dangerous. And so I think, I, because, because they undermine uh, the public's confidence in the impartiality of the, the judiciary. So, um, so anyway, so that was my, uh, that was my, the, 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 an old man appealing to uh, the, the days of the dinosaurs, uh, but it would be good for us to go back there. And, and I'm not, I haven't given up hope that that, that someday uh, can happen. I hope it will. Well, I think it, 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 uh, Judge Jackson's choice of you to introduce her reflects well on the both of you, certainly, but it also reflects well on the branch itself and uh, how, as colleagues, you operate together. And it really de deflates the notion of partisanship within the branch. So it was uh, a, a very welcomed uh choice uh, by Judge Jackson selecting you to introduce that, her. That, 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 that pleases me, but let me say there is not, there's nothing unusual about yeah, the way yeah. I feel about it. That's, it's not unusual. Yes, the fact yes, that people yeah. think it is, is I think a measure of the problem in front of us. Yes, I think that's right. And, and you, if this funnels into our topic uh, nicely of, of judicial independence, uh, before getting to a couple of specific questions about that and where, where, where we are at the moment and any threats we might see to it, um, let me ask you about, you, you just circle back a little bit, uh, your experience in the legislative branch. Did, it, did you find it useful uh, as a judge do you think we should have, there should be more uh, legislators uh, or, or at least those familiar with that process uh, on, the, on the judicial bench? Um, or, or is it, uh, you know, could, your experience was, was fine, but not a prerequisite for everyone? Yeah, I don't think it was a prerequisite uh, for, for everyone. Um, I, I do note that when I was on the DC circuit, there weren't many of us who had had any significant experience um, in Article One? Uh, many had had significant experience um, mm -hmm. in Article Two, um, and and so it's I, to me it's kind of funny how that played out amongst my colleagues. Many of them assumed that I knew a lot more uh, about Congress and Article One than I actually did, <laughs> but they would turn to me uh, as if I, somehow I was an expert to get my. Uh, my views on the matter, but 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 I, but I do think no, I I do think it helped uh, at least uh, my thinking. I have I have uh, great respect for the uh, for the Congress, warts and all, and there are considerable warts, right? There are considerable warts, but still, uh, it's an it's an institution, the House and and, and the Senate, uh, for which I for which I have respect. I, I'm I'm deeply worried, uh, as most of us are, about uh, about where they are uh, right now. Um, but yeah, I do think it, it, I think it had an influence on, on, on me. I think it probably, I think I probably started from a place with maybe a little bit more, uh, heartfelt deference than, than, uh, than others might've had. I mean, uh, Justice Scalia had a profound influence on all of us and, and me in particular. Um, I, I think, I think you can explain some of his, uh, approach to things as, as having, um, uh, shall we just say a wariness about uh, about about Congress and 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 uh, and how it does its work? Uh, I probably was not as wary. I'm probably more like Justice Breyer uh, on that thing, uh, on that issue than uh, than Justice Scalia. I I'm, I probably have more uh, uh, less wariness uh, about Congress. So yeah, I think I think it did uh, influence me in, in some uh, in some ways. Um. Let's talk about independence again. What, what constitutional protections are given to help secure judicial independence? And um, what threats do you see to that? Yeah, well, I mean, the two most obvious are the lifetime uh, appointment and the, uh, uh, the, the guaranteed, uh, guaranteed pay. And, uh, and those are important. Uh, those don't seem to be under uh, threat. 
it, what they're also important for is the, the message that they send. It's, it's, those are discrete elements of a larger uh, issue. The larger issue is truly judicial independence. And so um, I, 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 the thing I worry about most for judicial independence is what I just re referred to before is this increasing public perception uh, in the media and, and in Congress that judges mm -hmm. Uh, are our partisans, and so uh, I don't think that's true. And I think we, I think we need to be careful to main, to not allow that to be true. So therefore, uh, when I was on uh, the president's commission looking at the Supreme Court, um, although although we were we were our charter did not include giving recommendations. In fact, we were specifically told no recommendations. We just want you to spot the issues, the debate. And then analyze the debate. Well, in the course of that, I developed. I, I came to the commission with some views. Uh, some of them changed. Some of them were uh, uh, hardened. <laughs> uh, the one that was hardened was court expansion. I just think that. I, I mean, for the reasons Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer and others have identified. I just, to me, that would be waving a white flag of surrender on judicial. Independence. It would be saying, in effect, you know, we know the judges are going to be partisans, and so let's just give in to that. And I, I think we ought to resist that at, at, at every, with every fiber of our, our being. Uh, first of all, I don't think judges are partisans. On those few occasions where maybe they've acted that way, the response shouldn't be, okay, just go ahead and open the floodgates, be that way. No, the response ought to be, that's wrong. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you shouldn't do that. Get back in, get back in your lane. So, so I worry, I worry about the, uh, the uh, proposal for court expansion. Uh, although, um, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not good at political prognostications, but there doesn't seem to be much of a in, interest uh, with that. It certainly wouldn't get by uh, the Senate. Um, and I, you know, I don't know where the White House is on that, but I'd be surprised if the president were in favor of something like that. He seems to be very reluctant to go down that. Um, the, the one issue on which my views changed were on term limits. Uh, I, I came into the commission, not having thought about it that much, but thinking, you know, maybe that's a reasonable sort of approach to this. But by the end, I just thought it's too complicated. And, and again, I think the premise, one of the premises of that argument is that the judges are uh, partisans. And so I, I came away um, committed to the idea that no, that's, that's not a good idea. The, much of the impetus for the creation of the commission is driven by those who are deeply dissatisfied with the composition and the rulings of the present court. Um, and I'm not. Okay, um, and not just because many of, I follow the, the same approach that many of the justices do, not, I'm certain that's part of it, but not just because of that. But I, 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 I'm satisfied that their appointment is the result of a constitutional process. Presidents win according to an, a system that's established by the constitution. They nominate judges, justices they want, and the Senate gets to act on it. And everyone, each of the nine justices went through that constitutional process. And, and even if you're dissatisfied with the rulings they make, the answer is not to burn the house down. The answer is to win elections, you know, and persuade uh, people with the force of your, uh, of your ideas. Uh, Judge Gross, we, we normally uh, invite uh, our audience to send in questions to us, and we will do so again today, uh, that I will I'll take questions from the audience and read them to you okay. and, and as they come in. And, and as that uh, is occurring, a couple of other um, topics uh, in this vein uh, to, to, to go over. Um, the... the uh, your service on the commission was uh, greatly appreciated, and uh, those of us who labored in the judicial branch were, were very pleased that uh, you were appointed that, along with David Levy and a couple of other 
uh, leading lights uh, from the judicial branch who've gone on to uh, uh, other service. So uh, again, thank you for that. One of the um, uh, elements of judicial independence that I was exposed to over the years is the work uh, of its judicial conference and its committees, one of which you two of which you served on the uh, branch committee and the code uh, the conduct committee um, and how important is judicial uh, sort of institutional um, there, there's constitutional uh, independence which is provided for as you said by life tenure and no diminution in salary so there are the constitutional protections but there are also institutional protections and do you see any risks in, uh, I won't mention statutes by name or uh, bills by name, you may be uncomfortable weighing in on some that are, are um, uh, you know, out there at the moment, but uh, do you, and, and this also, I will just per, uh, put a little framework behind this question. We've had a couple of speakers um, uh, preceding you in this series that have illuminated uh, the way judicial independence has been eroded in foreign, uh, in other countries has been through legislative initiatives sort of disguised, uh, uh, but when you peel away uh, the, to, to the roots of those bills, and, and in particular, one of our speakers spoke about uh, uh, Poland and Hungary, um, they, they were really designed to shift power from the judicial branch and independence of the judicial branch into the legislative branch. Do you see um, threats in that regard and how important is uh, institutional independence? So I'm not certain I can name uh, specific threats other than the two I no. just two, two I just, no. just just mentioned. But um, I, I, I do think there is some, some learning that we in the judicial branch uh, can 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 take away from all this, and 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 that is that we, we have to be certain that we maintain the confidence of uh, of the American people and the Congress that that uh, that that we are running uh, an ethical and uh, impartial uh, uh, operation. And I think I think I think we are, but I mean that I think that means that we need to tend to our own house, which I think we. I give us high marks uh, on, on this. Uh, I was deeply involved in the DC Circuit's uh, response to the uh, uh, sexual harassment, sexual intimidation uh, uh, issues, and um, um, and that was that was a, a great a good exercise. Chief Judge Garland uh, uh, gave us a directive to just get it right and get to the bottom of this and create a, a system that would that would guarantee that all employees felt safe uh, and that there was a meaningful way to redress any grievances they had. And we worked hard uh, on that. He uh, appointed a committee, I think there were five of us or so, and we spent a long time, uh, talked to a lot of people, talked to uh, uh, advocates and, uh, and came up with, I think, a really uh, a, a good approach. Um, so I think that's a model of, we need to be nimble as the judiciary. We we need to be responsive, um, and I'm hoping that uh, when we when we show that we are responsive to genuine concerns, um, that that will uh, uh, that will persuade uh, Congress to stay in their lane, <laughs> so no, that we no. so, so that we don't have so we don't have uh, overreach uh, on, no. on there. No. Well but, said. I, I do think I'll, I'll speak up. Um, I do think. Um, the constant uh, plea by some in Congress to uh, to televise uh, uh, Supreme Court hearings uh, arguments, I think I, I think that's the real threat. Actually, I think that's a real uh, a real threat. I I I, I once heard I won't name it. I, I once heard a sitting justice say, "Name that branch of government whose performance has improved." <laughs> When televised, <laughs> and so, uh, no, so I'm a, I, I'm a child of Watergate. I'm a I love FOIA. I'm all for transparency uh, in 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 government. But uh, I, I I we all know 
uh, there, there's no, no question what would happen if Supreme Court arguments were televised um, and were part of the, the nightly news. Uh, and I, I think that would be very, very uh, un unfortunate. So there, there's one that uh, it, it's a perennial uh, topic of uh, discussion. I, I haven't followed closely enough. Has has Judge Jackson been asked her views on that? I I, they, I don't know. I haven't heard uh, yeah, a, yeah. a question in that regard. But it's it was interesting. I think uh, that previous recent um, nominees, when asked, even when they had expressed uh, an openness uh, to the idea, once they served started serving on the court, uh, to change their views pretty. Uh, easily and it wasn't uh, any heavy-handed lobbying on the part of the other of their colleagues it was just a realization that uh, the work of the court is, is not really captured entirely or accurately in just in, in, a, in an oral argument but rather they, there's so much more that goes on to it right. that it, uh, it didn't and, lend you know, itself and, and, and the, the transparency side of me i hope they keep what's going on now i mean there's been you, you, the public can have, have easy access to what's happening. Just, uh, no, no. I, I just don't think that access would, would benefit the court or. Well, I think that, you know, they're doing audio now, yeah, live yeah. audio, or it did during the pandemic. So that that's been a, a step in a, a direction that short of cameras in the courtroom. So yeah, cameras are different. They're just, yeah, different. they are. Yeah. Um, Questions from the audience. Uh, what can sitting Article Three district judges do, if anything, other than doing their jobs well to help clarify for litigants and the public that they are not partisans? This, that's a very good question. And I've been wrestling with that myself as during this conversation. What more can we do to get the message out? I mean, you've articulated it very nicely today, uh, Judge Griffith, but uh, Instant. Are there things that the branch could be doing? I think there are. I, I, I would. I would. I, and, and and a lot of judges do this on their own anyway. But I would like this. I, I wish there was more public. I, I wish judges would take more time to go in the public and speak in in a public setting about things. We uh, we all remember when Justice Breyer and Justice Scalia did their roadshow on PBS, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But here they were debating the use of international, international law on the court. The, the, the subject matter of their debating to me wasn't as important as the image. Here you had these two brilliant jurists with very different views on matters, and yet they were demonstrating that they had a fondness for one another and a respect for one another. Um, that's part of it. Uh, I, I, the, the more the American people can see how judges do their work, short of cameras in the courtroom, <laughs> short of the court. but the more they can see that, I think, I know, the more confidence they'll have um, that no decisions aren't made along uh, 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 partisan lines. So, so I, you know, I think this is one where we ought to be uh, more proactive uh, than we are in, in getting uh, uh, judges appointed by all different types of presidents out there to tell this story. I, I'm not saying anything unusual. I'm saying what every judge I know experiences in, 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 in real life. And yet, yet it, it, when, I, when I speak to law schools, when I speak in public, people are surprised by this. They, they don't believe it, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but uh, even, if, even if I can get persuade them to believe it, they're greatly pleased by that. Um, and so I would think that's one thing that uh, may, maybe we can do a better job. We're not real good at self-promotion, you know, mm -hmm. um, but this is one where I think we ought to be uh, self-promoting more because uh, American confidence in the judiciary uh, is, is at stake and, you know, and it's declining now. It's declining. So I think we need to be proactive in response. Well, I, we're very glad you're speaking out publicly about it, Tom, and, and, and that's a, a start. Do you think uh, that, that there should be a special test to know the impartiality or uh, determine the impartiality when appointed or electing a judge? And, and uh, I would just, this is one from the audience, and I may add a little uh, one of my own. And if, 
you know, how could that be? Could is there a way of doing that? I mean, how do how do you convey impartiality? And I'll just just leading up to your answer uh, suggests that part of the uh, um, confirmation hearing process, the nominees tend to well, they can't answer direct questions about how they're going to rule on a specific kind of case. So how do you devise a, a, a test of impartiality? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we get some social psychologist. Yeah, social psychologist, some neurologist to answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the framers approach um, uh, and the first Congress's approach was the oath, right? The oath. Mm. Mm. Uh, they yeah. had great confidence. They have yeah. great confidence in an oath, and you know, and I do too. But I, uh, but maybe there ought to be more discussion of the role of the oath and 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 and, and what the, and what that means. Um, uh, that's a good idea. Um, I mean, that, that's how the framers approach it. I don't, I don't know. Short of that, what you could, uh, what you could do. Well, I, well, behaviors change under oath. Uh, we know that uh, they should. And, hopefully, and, they do. Yeah. Hopefully no. They do. no. And uh, that, that's a very good point. Uh, a similar question uh, from our audience. I wonder if the problem of, pe of people thinking that judges are partisan is that when they are nominated, their political affiliation always matches that of the nominating president of the United States. Although you gave a good example in your own situation before that wasn't the case. How can we change that mindset? That is a really big question, and and here's here's why we probably can't have a hard have a hard time uh, changing it because the many of the politicians believe that that they believe that judges are partisans in robes, right? They no. they, they, they they believe yeah. that, and right. so um, uh, and and so that becomes a shorthand, uh, you know, party affiliation becomes a shorthand expression after that. I, you know, I, I, I don't know how uh, to, to, to get out of that um, uh, other than judges just need to perform impartially and maybe surprise their, uh, their appointing president. Uh, and that happens invariably, right? That it happens invariably. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the odd thing about, one of the odd things about the judiciary is that it's, it's supposed to be Nonpartisan, right? Members of the judiciary are supposed mm -hmm. to be nonpartisan, and yet they are created in a process that's partisan, right? Um, and so that there's the tension right there. And you know, my hope would be, and this just sounds like foolishness when I when I say it, but I hope for my hope would be that 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 politicians can see that when they when they make it partisan, they're hurting it. They're they're really you know, throwing body blows to the idea of an independent judiciary uh, and to somehow uh, move off that. The easiest way to do that, and this shows you that it's not that easy, but the, the what I would wish would happen is that one of the parties, in this case, the Republican Party, would stand up and say, look, Judge Jackson is qualified. Come on, there's no serious dispute about that. We are going to confirm her and, and it'd be a, you know, here's my pipe dream, a hundred and nothing vote, right? And then when a Republican president gets elected and he or she wants to appoint a judicial conservative, that the Democrats would say, well, no, yeah, that's how it, that's how it works. Go right ahead. We're supporting you. Now that's my you know, pipe dream. Um, uh, but that's one oh. place to start. I'm hoping that there will be some Republican senators this time. No. Who will Will break right? the fact that no the fact that no Democrats broke ranks uh, on the Amy Coney Barrett nomination it's just, that's outrageous. The fact mm -hmm. how can anyone vote against the Chief Justice or or or, or, or any of the current just they're all mm -hmm. highly qualified that 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 many of their votes were partisan uh, is a is a, a a measure of the problem that we have. So I would start I would start there. I'm not that hopeful about it, but I would start there that uh, if, if, if the Senate can can return to regular order, yeah, maybe, that's a very, maybe, that's yeah. a, maybe that's a beginning, but. Well, your, your remarks there uh, to introduce Judge Jackson were uh, you know, just right on, on the mark uh, as far as I'm concerned. And, and uh, I, I would, we would 
all benefit, I think, from from a for uh, from a return to regular order, and it's the way it used to work. And and uh, and you had uh, judges and justices appointed that uh, uh, you know didn't clearly match the political uh, or viewpoints of of their appointing president. Um, certainly in in practice or the way that the you know. It, yeah, no, 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 make, make, make no mistake. If I were president of the United States, a, a scary thought, a scary <laughs> thought. I would want to appoint a highly qualified originalist and textualist, because I think that's the mm -hmm. best way to mm -hmm. be faithful to the Constitution. But I recognize that reasonable people can differ from that point of view. And so if I'm not elected president, but someone who has a different view of how to read the due process clause, wants to put someone on the bench. I think you get to do that. I, I th think you get to do that. Yes. Well, uh, Tom, I'm gonna call you Tom, but Judge Griffith, uh, thank you so much for your time today. We're delighted you were able to join us. And um, I, I wanna invite our audience to uh, uh, continue to support our, our work at the Supreme Court Historical Society. And uh, you can go online at uh, www.supremecourthistory.org to um, uh, use our gift shop or uh, support us in any way you see fit. Um, we're grateful for your time today, Judge Griffith, and uh, it's been a, a very uh, wonderful uh, series that we've put together, and uh, we've we're been uh, very fortunate to have uh, such well-qualified people speak to these topics for us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've, I've enjoyed it and, and hope it was beneficial to some. I think it, I think it was. Thanks so much. And yeah, thank, you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today.